Thank you so much for joining us for this session, Attorney General. So, we're just going to start right off with getting us, could you give us an update on the ruling of the Apostle versus Attorney General case that was um, mentioned out in the High Court? Well, the learned High Court Judge, Mr. Gino Passad, ruled that His Excellency the President acted unconstitutionally when he suspended the Police Service Commission. That decision we disagree with and it is the government's intention to file an appeal against that decision. We believe that the President acted properly and as the program unfolds in the, in the discussion, I will explain why I hold that view. Mm -hmm. So, um, what exactly are the government's next steps as it relates to the Well, the judge has ordered that the parties begin discussions in relation to costs. So, we will do that in compliance with the judge's uh, directions. But significantly, we will appeal the judge's decision to the Court of Appeal of Guyana and then we will see how we move from there. The important thing about the case though is that the case really has no practical importance anymore. It has been overtaken by time and many of the crucial reliefs that Mr. Paul Slow was claiming fell away with the passage of time and with the occurrence of several events. And perhaps I should go back into the history so that viewers would understand. So the Police Service Commission is an independent body responsible for the promotion of certain ranks in the police force and for disciplining those ranks. Mr. Paul Slow and this Police Service Commission are supposed to be independent and the judge in various excerpts in his judgment emphasized that need for such a constitutional organ to be independent to act independent, to appear impartial, and to behave with a certain degree of rectitude. Mm -hmm. Those are the constitutional obligation and indeed duties imposed on organizations such as the Police Service Commission. What we had in this case is quite historic and unprecedented at various levels and from various perspectives. First of all, Mr. Paul Slow is an open critic of the government and that is not uh, a secret. There is another gentleman there, Mr. Conway. He also is an open critic of the government. When the 2020 emergency budget was passed in September of 2020 after a five months hiatus preceding the or succeeding the March 2nd elections, all the constitutional time frames for the passing of a budget had expired. And I said then that we have to bring back the constitutional track of the government back on course because it had careened off. You see, after the elections, the constitution, for example, says that parliament must convene within 90 days, three months, and then a budget has to be passed within a certain period and all those are constitutional prescriptions they had all expired so we had to pass the budget because there was no budget 
and you can't run a country without a budget. So notwithstanding the expiration of all the constitutional time frames, we still proceeded to pass a budget in the parliament so that the country can continue to be governed and services can continue to be provided for the people of Guyana. Notwithstanding the fact that it is the APNU AFC that caused the delay of five months for the declaration of the results, and therefore they caused all the time frames to be expired. When we actually passed that budget, they rushed to court. Mahi Paul and a whole host of them rushed to court and challenged the legality of that budget. Strangely, Paul Slow and this very police service commission joined the politicians in that litigation. And what they were in essence trying to do, among other things, was to challenge the budgetary allocations to that very agency that they are presiding over. And they wanted orders to prevent the finance minister to disburse monies approved in that budget to the very agency that is the Police Service Commission. So right there, one has to question the intent of this organization. The team representing those who challenged the budget, those who challenged the budget were all parliamentarians, and these persons in the Police Service Commission. And all the lawyers who appeared were members of parliament for APNU. Raphael Trotman, Kemraj Ramjatan, Roysdale Ford, at least they were the names on the record. So right there you, you see a impartial police service commission or an organization that is supposed to be impartial under the constitution, free from political bias, choosing to align itself with a group of politicians, a group of politicians in a politically inspired litigation. Right there, alarm bells ought to be ringing. Because in my view, that apparent independent organization has decided to shed its independence and to take a political alignment disqualifying itself from holding an office which requires independence and political neutrality. That's the first point I want to make. Then in addition to that, it was discovered that Mr. Paul Slow and I believe another member of the organization did some $10 million work of consultancy with the Guyana Police Force while they held the office of Police Service Commission. So they are in essence, they were in essence being paid by an agency that they are supposed to supervise that they are supposed to act impartially in relation to, that they are supposed to exercise disciplinary powers over, they are receiving a pecuniary interest to the tune of some $10 million in consultancy to do work for this very organization. How can they exercise their powers and their functional responsibility without bias when they have a vested pecuniary interest. There is a second point I want to make. In consequence, two of them, I believe, were charged and are placed before the court for fraudulent, some, some fraud in relation to this sum of money. So now we have moved from political bias to a pecuniary interest that is repulsive, and now we have moved to charges in the criminal court being instituted against these persons. 
Then you had another allegation surfacing where Mr. Paul Slow is alleged to be involved in some sexually improper conduct with a female officer of the force. The complaint is that the lady made the complaint since 2019, but it was swept up under the carpet. It's only after 2020 that the report became public. I believe that there are charges in relation to that as well. So we now move into the criminal realm. Then in addition to that, you had a number of police officers who approached the court to challenge the manner in which this police service commission was treating with their appointments. And these are, were senior officers. They were claiming that they were bypassed for promotions, that there were disciplinary charges instituted against them, which were deliberately not being heard by the very Police Service Commission. And the, the fact of those charges being pending were held against those very policemen by the very police service commission who are not hearing the charges so as to keep them not being promoted. So you had that bundle of complaint from police officers and they approached the court claiming bias, claiming favoritism, claiming discrimination, claiming recrimination against this police force, this police service commission, sorry. Then you had another bundle of complaint that related to a list that this police service commission wanted to promote, which list did not follow the procedure that existed for a number of years in the police force in respect of how police officers are to be appointed. So apparently in the police force there is a process that a list of proposed um, officers who are about to be promoted, they have to travel a particular course within the police force. Certain uh, recommendations must come from certain agencies within the force. It is alleged by the very officers that these procedures were abrogated by this police service commission. And they were moving at breakneck speed to promote one set of officers, disregarding others who feel that they are deserving of promotion, and at the same time violating the procedure by which these police officers have to travel before they reach the Police Service Commission for uh, promotion. Letters were written to the Police Service Commission objecting to this course of conduct. But they were proceeding with breakneck speed in trying to get the then Police Service Commission, the Police Commissioner, to promote these officers and to get the, the the Secretary of the Police Service Commission to publish these names in the official gazette to conclude this promotion of a set of police officers that they seem to have a vested interest in promoting. Now, it is against that backdrop that the President intervened. Now, the President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. The President is the Supreme Executive Authority of the land. It is the president who appoints the police service commission and the president is vested with certain powers in certain cases to act. When an organization like the police service commission misbehaves and the procedure to do so is laid out in the constitution. Now the president is faced with these sets of facts that I've just outlined. And these are not facts that can be disputed. This is a police service commission, an important constitutional body, against whom all these allegations are being leveled. Now, 
the process requires that the Prime Minister must write to the Police Service Commission calling upon them to show cause why actions should not be taken. And then they are allowed to respond. Once they are allowed to respond, then the Prime Minister will determine whether he will recommend the case to the President. Once the case is recommended to the President, the President can either act or don't act. If he decides to act, he then must go to the Judicial Service Commission and ask for a tribunal to be established. And once that tribunal is established, the President can then suspend the Police Service Commission and then ask that the tribunal investigate the matter. That is the procedure laid out in the Constitution. The problem and all those the steps were followed in that the Prime Minister wrote to the Police Service Commission detailing allegations of wrongdoing against them and asking them to show cause. They responded. The Prime Minister then made a decision that he will recommend the matter to the President and ask for steps, disciplinary steps to be taken. The problem arose when the President looked around, there was no Judicial Service Commission to whom he can turn for the establishment of the tribunal. So that is the narrow issue in the case. What should a president have done in those circumstances? Allow such a rogue organization to proceed with a course of action that would have had destructive consequences to the police force of the country, the municipal um, authority for the maintenance of law and order in Guyana, or he should sit and twiddle his thumb because there is no Judicial Service Commission. What the President did in the exercise of his executive power and in the exercise of his deliberate judgment and because there is no JSC to whom he can turn to establish this tribunal, he proceeded to exercise a power which he has which is to suspend. So he skipped a step in the process because the step could not have been taken because of the absence of a judicial service commission. It's not that the president did not have a power to suspend. The president has a power to suspend. But the constitution sets out a chronology of steps that must be taken or should be taken. But that is on the assumption that those steps can be taken. What is in the best interest of the country? What is in the best interest of public safety? What is in the best interest of good governance? Having a rogue police service commission who is bent on promoting officers who are undeserving of promotion according to the police force itself and who is bent on promoting officers in breach of the procedures? And who is being accused of excluding from that list officers who claim that they are deserving of promotion? You know what that would have, what impact that would have had on the morale of the force and consequently on law and order in Guyana? A president has a duty to act in those circumstances. That is why he's elected by the people. In the absence of constitutional uh, process or in the absence of a vacuum, all executive power goes back to the president. And he is required to act in the public's interest and in, in the interest of national security. And that is how, the, and that is why the president acted. Now, in the meanwhile, and that is when they went to court, right, to try to get the president. Well, they did a number of things, all of which they failed. One, they sued the president personally, and I filed an application and got the president's name removed from the proceedings. They then tried to get the police 
promotions blocked, right? Because, oh, I forget one step of the proceedings. By the time they file these proceedings, I filed the objection to the president being named as a party. And that took a few months to determine. By that time, their tenure expired. So they were no longer members of the police force, uh, police service commission. A new police service commission was then sworn in. Imagine we have a police service commission then sworn in. This one is expired. We went to the judge and we said, look, we now have a new police service commission. This grouping here that has a case in the name of the police service commission must not be allowed to continue the case. You have now a police service commission. The judge overruled us on that point and allowed Mr. Paul Slo to maintain this case and to continue in litigation while we have a real police service commission. They then tried to get orders to block, by that time, Mr. we were able to dismantle the list that they had and a new list was created following the proper procedure. And the now Commissioner of Police, Mr. Clifton Hickins, I believe, um, allowed that list to be published and those officers were properly promoted. They wanted to reverse that process and get their list promoted. They lost on that ground. So the proper list following the procedure was the list that were eventually promoted. So they didn't get through with that either. So all they were left with was, a was the issue of whether they were properly suspended by the president. In my view, from the time their tenure expired, then the litigation ought to have come to an end. A litigation can be continued by a phantom. It was replaced by a legitimate police service commission. At a minimum, that police service commission should have then stepped in the shoes of the case, started by a police service commission whose tenure had expired, whose membership had expired. You now have a police service commission appointed. The judge overlooked all of that. So all of these matters will have to be ventilated at the appellate court when we file the appeal early next week. I am confident that we are going to succeed. The case raises a number of important constitutional issues. For example, the behavioral conduct and the, the political and other, well, not the, the behavioral conduct of a police service commission, the type of posture it can take in respect of political matters, the decorum of members of such an organization, what if they are charged with criminal offenses, can they continue in office? All these issues will have to be ventilated and pronounced upon at the final level. What does a president do when you have a, 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 a judicial service commission that is vacant? and you need to establish a tribunal or exercise a power of suspension, a power which the president has. We had a similar issue arising when there was no opposition leader and we had to appoint a police commissioner after Mr. Nigel Hoppy left the force. Remember, the president is required to consult with the leader of the opposition. At the time, there was no leader of the opposition. Rather than leave the police force headless, the president appointed Mr. Clifton Hicken. They went to the court and they challenged that. And the chief justice ruled and said, if there is no leader of the opposition, then the president must be allowed to act in the public's interest. The appointment of a police commissioner is an integral function in the maintenance of law and order in a country. You can't have a police force headless 
Who will perform all the functions that a police force is required to perform when it has no leadership? And the Chief Justice in that case rightly concluded that the President acted properly when he looked around and he didn't see an opposition leader, they was not appointed, and he proceeded to make the appointment. In this case, there is great similarity. The President looked around, there was no Judicial Service Commission, and he proceeded to exercise a power that he has, just like he exercised a power that he has to appoint an acting commissioner, a power that he has to suspend. And in that case, the Chief Justice held that he was right, and in this case, Mr. Gino Passat held he's wrong. So I believe that we have good grounds of appeal and we have the authority of the Chief Justice's judgment to stand on. And the government intends to pursue these matters. These matters are important for law and order. They are important for democracy. They are important for good governance. They are important for constitutional um, growth in our country.